Thanks for joining us for another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here at the News Forum, where all voices matter. Recently, the Biden administration has moved to block certain semiconductor chips from being accessible to China. This has far-reaching consequences for economies and for geopolitics moving forward, including for Canada. Here to discuss this is R Richard Shimuka. He is a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute think tank. Welcome to Boom and Bust, Richard. Thanks for having me. So I guess, uh, I guess the first thing to ask is, what exactly are these export controls that were announced by the White House? So what they are is a pretty expansive series of basically licensing and control uh, policies that are intended to work all in conjunction in order to prevent China from acquiring or at least understanding what China is trying to acquire in terms of uh, chips, the, uh, their ability to manufacture it, uh, graphic processing units, other sort of high-end equipment that's basically intended to be utilized in the development of uh, artificial intelligence applications within the Chinese economy. And these are all sort of, they're all synergistic. So they're all trying to work together in order to prevent, to really limit China's ability to sort of develop and produce these high-end chips in, uh, in their market. So is this a new thing? Has, it, has this ever been done before to limit these types of chips? Yes and no. Uh, so certainly export controls have been an important part of how the United States tries to limit technology spread of certain critical technologies. This has gone back all the way back through the Cold War and on different different areas. What's kind of different in this case is that it's just how expansive it is. And, and that's partly because of the how the manu the the, how chips are manufactured and how they're utilized. What we're kind of seeing right now is the, artificial intelligence has a lot of civil uses, you know, like how we try to look at weather patterns or how we try to model, let's say, new types of biological uh, applications like with uh, pharmaceuticals, right? But it also has significant military applications. And this is the part that the Biden administration is really trying to aim at is try to limit their ability to utilize chips in a way that can be uh, applied to sort of Miller technologies. And this is a really major cutting area, area of development and research that we're seeing today. So what's different in this case is that there's a lot of areas that kind of have these civil applications, and this is going to really curtail their ability to sort of develop their civil industry as well to the extent where it's it's got a broader economic effect. And that's somewhat what's a bit different in this area. It's not purely military, but there's a significant civilian component to it as well. So it's that dual use aspect of it that they're trying to key in on. Absolutely. And that's and that's what's what's probably the most unique aspect of this is that it is so wide ranging. It covers so many different areas that that it's kind of seen as, as part of a broader economic competition, even though it was originally ostensibly aimed at the sort of the military side. Maybe tell us why this was necessary. Why do semiconductor chips matter so much? So we're kind of reaching a, a new era, I guess, in development of computers, let's say, right? And this is the, able, the ability of taking huge amounts of data, like on whether it be on how just atoms sort of organize themselves on a molecular level to how people kind of uh, interact in broader side of society. And so, as I said before, there's a dual use to this, right? And on the military side, what we're seeing now specifically is, is that we're able to take huge amounts of data about the environment from, let's say, our sensors or how people are talking online or whatnot, right? And computers are able to basically organize that process it and create really insightful um, insightful kind of uh, suggestions about what might happen. Now we see this a lot right now, like let's say a Facebook or a uh, or some of the social media platforms that are use that in order to do ads. But an example, a really pretty example would be in China with social credit system, which is how it, which is sort of this coercive system in order to sort of rate people within society. And AI is, is a key part of that because it's able to sort of identify patterns of life within uh, Chinese citizens and sort of rate them. So this the development of those kind of systems have real military applications, which could give China a major edge, let's say, in its competition to West. 
And this is an area that has really concerned uh, concerned major figures within the United States government. Right, right. Um, you see Eric Schmidt, who's uh, who advises. We're going to get. Where, uh, I'm afraid oh, we have to take yeah, a little break. Uh, very important point. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm here with Richard Shamuka. He's a senior fellow at McDonald Laurie Institute. Uh, Richard, uh, please continue your point about you know where these uh, semiconductor chips uh, you know play a role in our society. Please continue. Oh, so if you look at the United States, there's been major concern among senior decision makers. Uh, a couple months ago, Eric Schmidt, who was the former CEO of uh, of Google, uh, highlighted this is this is an area that the United States may lose, and he believes that. He advised that basically, if 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 this is an area that China is able to succeed in, which is a major goal of the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, that this could have serious serious consequences for for the United States and the broader West's ability to compete against China in in a whole range of fields, as we kind of talked about before, in this kind of dual use uh, technologies. So, uh, in terms of what this is analogous to, the people would understand. I, I think you mentioned in your article about this that it's kind of analogous to the Cold War in some ways and different in other ways. Maybe uh, go into that a little bit. Oh, it, I think that this is in some ways is kind of a new Cold War, right? Uh, a lot of these systems have, it's, it's ability, it, it touches all aspects of our society. Right. And it's utilized in ways that can, that can really give China a leg up with not just the hard security side, but just its broader economic competition. And and so if you look at what the United States administration is saying, and I, I might add, like even Christian Freeland, the deputy prime minister, basically said the same thing in a recent speech, uh, is that if we are not effective at competing with China on on these technologies or whatnot, that this this would this would be a major area uh, that we would we would we would basically uh, lose or we can we can we can not be as competitive with them going forward. Right. And it's not just a matter of competition. Uh, the, the thing about the Cold War was the economies were not interlocked with the, the Soviet Empire, but it was also a geopolitical fight as well. Absolutely. And I think that that's an interesting point, because is we did have sort of we did have sort of economic links with the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc you know, during the Cold War. In this case, we're much, much more interlocked with, with China. And a critical an area of this is critical uh, minerals, right? Uh, we look at uh, rare earth minerals. China is the world leader in the production of them, right? And if we don't shore up our supply chains, their ability to control our uh, economic processes, especially in this area, is is suspect, right? Uh, or our ability to control our own destiny on this area is suspect. So these efforts are kind of critical in order to ensure that we aren't disrupted by any, or we aren't able to be easily coerced in this area. I, I think we can look back maybe in the last decade or here where the Japanese uh, were, they were basically being attempted to be coerced by China over certain policies you know, utilizing their, by China leveraging its supply chains and its ability right. to actually operate in these areas. Right, right. No, good point, good point. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the role of state capitalism uh, entities uh, on this threat, because uh, for viewers who may not be aware, uh, when we're talking about Chinese businesses, there is a, a deep connection between some of those businesses and the Chinese Communist Party. So maybe go into that a little bit. Oh, absolutely. So this is a major area of, of what, what people have to realize is that China is actually, China's in the development of these, of specifically uh, computer chips, they're actually taking a loss on this. Like they are, or if they're making profits, it's very slim. This has been a major objective of the Chinese Communist Party to develop its AI research and its chip building uh, facility. They've spent literal tens of billions of dollars in this area in order to try to catch up with the West. and because they too see this as a major area of competition and ability to to sort of catch up and you know surpass the West. So this the state-owned enterprises uh, are funded in order to sort of develop their capacity and whatnot. And and the Western export controls that are that the US is trying to put into place is trying to sort of block this and make it much more 
costly for them to to get ahead, right? So they will have to develop an increasing amount of the tech, the underlying technologies that they need to get ahead. They can't facilitate their growth using Western uh, technologies that are existing and and sort of you know subsidize their own efforts. It all has to be now done through Chinese sources. Yeah, very interesting point. And and of course, uh, and I'm going to make this point because we're just about to get to a break. But uh, you know, this means that they have to divert more energy and more, uh, uh, you know, brain power uh, and resources to developing these chips because they, they will not be automatically available from Western sources. And so uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about China's reaction to this. We're going to take a brief break. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. And we're back here at Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Richard Schmuka, Senior Fellow, McDonald Laurie Institute, talking all things semiconductor chips. Uh, Richard, uh, before the break, I was just asking, you know, what, what is this decision to restrict or ban a certain exportation of, of these semiconductor chips to China? What's, uh, what's China's reaction to this? So thus far, it's been fairly muted. Uh, there's been some statements, uh, usual comments about how this is just falling to the Cold War trap, which perhaps may be accurate. But certainly there hasn't been much of an effort to to impose punitive me uh, measures back on the United States. That's partly, uh, there's probably a couple reasons for this. We just had the Chinese uh, Communist Party Congress, a huge event in their sort of, uh, in their society, uh, it kind of, cemented uh she's like our future uh future term right so that was a major focus of that right uh the other thing is that chinese exports are quite down uh and there's a bit reeling from a overall sort of um less than advantageous economic environment right and so right now putting more export controls probably doesn't help their economy it actually it actually hurts them. And this is kind of seen as a bit of a time of vulnerability uh, by some Western observers. So it's unclear whether they would want to, they would seek to impose certain controls right now, uh, especially also given that the actual range of what the United States has tried to impose in States isn't clear because it's so broad. And there are so many second and third order effects that they what it may actually turn out to involve maybe much greater or maybe a little less than what what's seen right now so there's a lot of kind of moving parts and and we may not see actual result or an actual full response for maybe a couple of weeks months maybe a year it, it's it's tough to say so right now not not much but that should discount something might happen in the future. And what uh, what will they likely? Ha I think maybe we covered a little bit of this, but what likely will they have to do? I mean, they they're going to need next generation semiconductor chips to run their economy too. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about how they're going to respond to it that way. So the export controls are really aimed at the most cutting edge uh, chips and G uh, graphic processing units, basically, and, and the ability for the Chinese economy to sort of develop and produce those systems. Less older systems or older technologies are are not as well covered. And so they're able to sort of continue acquiring and producing those systems. So their effects there, what's going to probably happen is, is China's probably going to sort of fall behind a bit and, and say maybe half decade let's say or a decade behind current western technologies it's tough to say exactly how they're going to do how they're going to surmount it now what they will try to do is try to build some of these they will likely i should say because we're not too sure yet they'll try to bring some of this technology in-house or indigenously and try to produce them and uh, which is quite likely they'll probably try to steal or you know undertake some sort of level of espionage to draw in some of these technologies from the west that they can't develop quickly enough in their own in their own sort of process, so there's going to be a lot of different kind of ability or a lot of different efforts that are going to see the Chinese government or the Chinese economy undertake in order to sort of overcome this major hurdle. What's really critical is is I guess is the how Western allies because not of all of the technologies that they need come from the West. Some right. of them come from from Netherlands, come from Japan, 
uh, obviously Taiwan, these are other major players, and they're going to try to, they're likely going to try, I should say, to draw in from those sources in order to uh, try to bring themselves back up towards where the cutting edge is uh, globally. Yeah, no, I'm presumably the Americans will lean on those uh, trade partners uh, not to do anything uh, with the Chinese government on those on those chips. So I, I, I'm sure that that'll be part of the dialogue that President Biden does. Uh, oh, it's already happened. Yeah, it already has yeah, happened. Yeah, so. good, good point, good point. We've got uh, less than a minute before the break, though. I want to start on the conversation, however, on Canada's role in all of this. We don't have semiconductor chip plants, but we do have some things, right? Oh, absolutely. And uh, we, it's, it's quite a, it quite a, we've already seen some of the steps on this uh, starting uh, specifically. So Canada has a role to play. It's just not, it's not like some of those countries I just uh, highlighted earlier. Uh, you got about 30 seconds left. Give us an example. Uh, critical uh, minerals. And right. I think you saw last week, the government uh, actually, or sorry, excuse me, a couple of days ago here, or excuse me, uh, late November, uh, mid-November that the government's already, uh, already started on this, on this process. Interesting. All right, we'll be back with our guest after this short break. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Richard Shamuka, Senior Fellow, McDonald Laurie Institute, talking all things uh, computer and semiconductor chips. Um, I think you mentioned in your article, Richard, that Canada uh, could potentially be a target for circumvention. Maybe get into that a little bit, how, uh, as you mentioned, China is going to use all methodologies, including espionage and whatnot, to try to circumvent. Uh, how does, where does Canada play a role in this? Well, let's just take that last part, espionage. And I think that uh, the recent discovery that there are you know, Chinese uh, security services that are operating the country, uh, and, and actually, you know, operating against our uh, election services, uh, certainly uh, technological espionage is, is going to be a part of that, right? And uh, because we are so intermeshed with the United States and that, you know, this, that our security services are unable to fully um, counteract some of these efforts that we are probably a prime target for, for, for this problem because their the ability for the Chinese to access, let's say, American technologies, certain some of these, you know, precursors or a part of the supply chain here may be easier if they're if they're not able to operate without uh, without you know being thwarted by our security services. So we are we are sort of a ripe area, I guess you could say, for the for for the Chinese government to operate in in order to break into some of these areas, and and there's. There's the other side of it, where it's the legal or the gray area, where Chinese uh, companies may cooperate or uh, Chinese um, scientists may cooperate with Canadians and, and knowingly or unknowingly sort of break uh, some of these export controls, right? So this is an area, like, given the sweeping nature of the U.S. government's export control effort, uh, the consequences for Canada are quite broad and quite uh, quite wide. And in order to keep to keep on side with them, we're going to have to be extremely vigilant and stringent in in their application because the Chinese are going to try to find every way to uh, to break this to break the stranglehold that the Americans uh, Americans have kind of put on their economy on in this area. And we're the place that they're going to try to do so. You raised a couple of good points, uh, and you also are referencing uh, very recently the government of Canada put out a, a basically a, a paper examining the security threats of the People's Republic of China uh, to uh, you know the Western multilateral systems around the world, and and indeed our own democracy, where there is uh, just confirmed evidence of interference in the last uh, last couple of federal elections. So uh, definitely uh, something to look uh, at more in more detail. And so my question to you is, uh, what, how should the government of Canada react? Uh, how should it protect our citizens and our technology and our, uh, you know, intellectual property? All of these things uh, do a better job of all of that. Well, I think 
one of the positive or one of the ways we can do so uh, is really to work with the United States. Uh, the United States is going to need allies on this. As I said before, there are other countries like Japan, like the Netherlands, like Germany or um, like Taiwan who are there. They need on side in order to ensure that this is effective, because if there is sort of bleed through, if there's the if there's other parties are not following suit, it's Chinese ability to actually develop their own indigenous supply networks is going to be much easier. So Canada needs to sort of, I think Canada to some degree can kind of say, look, we, we're on side with this. We're going to go ahead and imp, uh, implement your controls as best we can in our own economy and be vigilant for sort of Chinese efforts to infiltrate our, our supply chains and try to, you know, uh, steal our technology or try to gain an advantage through us, right? And and I think that that provides more help for the United States to to go to the other countries. And say, hey, look, this is not just us. This is now an alliance of many different countries that are trying to uh, trying to you know uh, implement these measures. On the other side of it is that this is actually an opportunity for Canada. Canada does have some a significant but small uh, parts of the uh, parts of the semiconductor supply chain uh critical minerals is a critical part and and china is a world lead as i said earlier china is a world leader so developing our own indigenous parts of the supply chain can be seen as an opportunity that right. we can help make this more resilient and that's i think that would be another side of it well i think you've given us a lot to chew on there richard Shmuka. i want to thank you for being our guest today very interesting discussion thanks for joining us thanks for having me very interesting discussion with Richard Shimuka there. Uh, really a lot going on in the semiconductor chip space and uh, has an impact on the economy and on politics as usual. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>